15th, Sunday after Pentecost, in fact, we're in Kentucky every uh, weekend of the young and old gathering. And the epistle for this 15th Sunday, taken from St. Paul's in Galatians, chapter 5. Brethren, if we live by the Spirit, by the Spirit let us also walk. Let us not become desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Brethren, if a person is caught doing something wrong, you who are spiritual, instruct such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he himself to be something, whereas he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let everyone test his own work, so he will have glory in himself only, and not in comparison with another. For each one will bear his own burden. And let him who is instructed in the word share all good things with his teacher. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For what a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who, he who sows in the flesh, from the flesh also will reap corruption. But he who sows in the spirit, from the spirit will reap life everlasting. In going, doing good, let us do not grow tired, for in due time we shall reap if we do not relax. Therefore, while we have time, let us do good to all men, and especially to those who are of the household of the faith. In the Gospel, according to St. Luke, chapter 7. At that time, Jesus went down to a town called Naim, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. And as they drew near the gate of the town, behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother. And she was a widow. And a large gathering from the town was with her. And the Lord, seeing her in compassion on her, and said to her, Do not weep. And he went up and touched the stretcher, and the hair bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to thee, Arise. And he who was dead sat up and began to speak. And he gave him to his mother. But fear seized upon all. And they began to glorify God, saying, The great prophet is risen amongst us, and God hath visited his people. Those are the words of today's holy God. trip overseas this last month, month, month or so, Australia, the Philippines, and a few days ago returning from India, arriving here in time with this old gathering. And a few considerations today on returning from the, in, in the Delhi airport, notice all the TV cameras in the new airport, all the, all the screens in the airport as they're walking through to get to the various gates. And every single screen was a fashion show. A fashion show to show the Indians. And notice also very much more of the fashions being shown in the billboards, the fashions being shown more and more. Because there was a great move of the devil to destroy modern, to destroy the, what's left of traditional or Catholic man. And in India, you still have traditional dress. You still have traditional clothing. There was a very great movement to get rid of the saris, to get rid of the dress of the of the old times, and to replace with the modern dress, modern dress of women dressing like uh, lesbians, the men dressing in a very effeminate manner, and each one trying to be cool and trying to fit in. And dress is a very important part of the battle, noticeable very much in the battle of the last 100 years. We will destroy the Catholic Church by destroying women, said the Masons more almost 200 years ago. And one of the ways they'll destroy the woman is by changing her dress. And in the attack against the Catholic Church, the changing of dress, the changing of clothing. And today, a few considerations on clothing. And one of the, when we go back to the very beginning, time, we find that God had created Adam and Eve perfect. And they did not have any clothing. And then there came original sin. And then there came the redemption. 
And yet when we read in the book of Apocalypse, when we read about the end of the world, when we read about heaven, we see that all of the saints, they shall not be as Adam and Eve were, who did not have clothing, but they were adorned with virtue. They were adorned with, uh, with the gifts that God gave them, great gifts that God gave to man. He gave him the great intellect, infused knowledge. He gave to him a strength and co a, a control over his passions by reason. And he gave him a strong will. And he gave him the virtues. And he gave him freedom from suffering and death. He could not grow cold. He could not grow hot. His body was perfect, and therefore he needed not clothing. So one would think, when God redeems man, that there will be the clothing of virtue that shall also be in heaven. But when we read in the book of Apocalypse and read the visions of the saints, we find that there is clothing in heaven. They will wear white robes. They shall wear stoles. The feet of those that preach the gospel of peace, they're going to be shod with sacred clothing. And we'll be able to tell in heaven who is who, what they did, what they were, what their glory is by their clothing. Now God did not originally intend for man to wear clothing. This is actually one of the punishments of original sin. But in redeemed man, we say in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, Mirabilius Re Fomas. He more wonderfully redeemed him. He made man wonderful in the beginning. He made him more wonderful afterwards. As we mentioned very often, Father Coleridge, a Jesuit priest of 150 years ago, 130 years ago, preached about the end of the world, spoke about this Mirabilius Re Fomasti. He said, what is it that makes man more wonderful than he was before? Because what can be more wonderful than a life that goes on forever? And what we find out is more wonderful is called death. And what can be more wonderful than to be adorned with virtue? To be adorned with all the virtues that Adam had and all the virtues that Eve had. And the beauty of Adam and Eve was incomparable. Their beauty was magnificent, but the beauty was inside of themselves. When we go to heaven, we're going to find a greater beauty. A beauty that is not only from the inside, it is going to emanate outwards. And one part of that is going to be in fashion and clothing. There will be clothes in heaven. There are sacred festivals. When we go back to the very beginning, you find that the very first clothing was made by God. Adam and Eve recognized when they looked at themselves after their sin that they were not so beautiful anymore. That they were not so strong anymore. And they recognized that they were naked. They looked at themselves and saw that they were naked. Therefore they were ashamed to stand before God. And they went and hid themselves in the bushes. When God told them about the redemption, and God told them, Who told you you were naked? For you could not know unless you had eaten of the forbidden fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so God made for them the first clothing. St. Augustine tells us that clothing, in fact, it is made by God first for the, by the killing of Adam. Clothing began not with fabrics made from plants, but fabrics made from goats, fabrics made from animals, and it was not made except by death. Therefore, he says, garments. Garments, in fact, are priestly, and garments are sacred, and they remind us of the priesthood. It is one of the reasons why, in the world today, whenever a man goes to sin, they remove their garments. A man goes to impurity in the modern world, they remove their garments, they run around naked, and when they, when they do wear clothing, what is the purpose of the clothing, particularly the clothing of women? The purpose of the clothing is to show off the body. And so even clothing that is worn in this world is to show off the body. Now they have all impure clothing, but even in olden times, the clothing was to show off the greatness of the individual, to show off the body, to show off the person who wore it. What about that first vestment? 
God killed the first Adam. He was killed by God. And his uh, skins were taken and to be made into clothes that adorned Adam and Eve. And he chose that this is something that would not change. And so therefore, what is the sacredness of vestments? What is the sacredness of clothing? And does it matter? We learn from the Masons today, and we learn from the enemies of God, clothing matters very much. We also know that because this is the way, by the matter of clothing, by the fashion in Paris, and the fashions of the t that they put forth on TV, Learn in India, for instance, one reason why they put they brought electricity to all the villages. And so that they could put a TV in every single place. In order to do what? Get those girls out of their clothings. They're still wearing saris. They're still dressing like ladies. Get the men out of their traditional dotis. Get them out of their clothing. So that they might change, after they change their clothing, they will change their spirit. After they change their clothing, they will change their ways. And they will take on the modern world, and the way they will take it, and the sign will be clothing. We also see in regard to religion. How do we know the Muslims are taking over? Because we see the ladies in their clothing. How do we know that Hollywood is destroying the world? Because we see the clothing in other all all our souls. What's the answer? The answer is the sacredness of vessels. There is a sacred clothing, and it changes the world. St. Augustine talking about it says, Consider this great day. There is a great and terrifying day. Now God himself said he was going to redeem mankind. Adam and shame walked out of the garden of paradise, the clothes made by God to cover his nakedness. That's how he walked out. Come forward a couple thousand years. Well, three thousand years. The day that Jesus, the high priest, was walking back, as we mention often, from the city of Babylon. And his vestments were taken from him, and he was in rags. He was on his way back to Jerusalem. But there was no temple for him to offer the sacrifice. It was destroyed. There were no vessels for him to worship because they were covered, desecrated, and ruined by Balthazar. And his vestments were gone and destroyed. And he was returning in rags. We see also the importance of clothing here because of the response of the devil. The devil came to God and he mocked him. He had a special visit to heaven, an appointment with God. And he said, look at your high priest. Jesus the high priest was the high priest of Jerusalem when they returned from Jerusalem, when they turned from the captivity. High priest returning in rags. Look at your high priest. Look at him. Is that your priest? Behold, he has rags. Behold, he is filthy. Is that your priest? And he is going back to Jerusalem. Where is the temple that you said you would build by David's son Solomon? It's gone. And then God looked down. To Jesus the high priest. And he recognized him. He recognized him. And when he looked down at him, he said, Ah, I recognize that man in rags. I recognize him. Is not this the, the brand that was plucked from the burning? It was a stick of wood. Like every soul, a stick of wood being prepared for the fire of hell. It was a stick of wood being cast into the fire. And there are millions and millions of sticks of wood wrapped in bundles and cast into the fire. And our Lord speaks about this also in His parable. At the end of the world, they're going to gather together 
all of the cockle and gather it in bundles and throw it in the fire. This was one of those sticks of wood, one of those pieces of cockle that was being thrown into the fire, but he recognized him. Is not this the brand that was plucked from the burning? He had reached in, pulled out one piece of wood among all the millions of others. One piece of weed, one cockle, among all the millions of others, and he pulled it out. And then he said, I will give him new vestments. And that's what God said of the devil. I will give him new vestments. He returns in rags, but he will not put on the vestments of the high priest before, the vestments of Aaron. He will put on new vestments, and here he was speaking of the New Testament priesthood that Jesus the high priest was symbolizing as he returned in rags. I will give him new vestments. They shall be most clean. They shall be most wonderful. And he shall have a great glory. This man, Jesus the high priest, he shall have a great glory. And he shall be glorified. He shall be glorified with his sacred vestments. And he shall stand in glory before men in these holy vestments. And I will give him a new temple and so on. And so he went. There will be a new temple built. And this will be the temple that Jesus Christ our Lord would walk into. The temple built by Ezra is not the one built by Solomon. This will be the temple in which he will perform his miracles temple in which he would speak. He did not will to do that in the temple built by Solomon. Rather in the one built by Esdras. Rather in the new temple. And so there's something that matters. Our Lord himself also says in the gospel today, the epistle today for instance there are two sides of this mystery. Every man shall bear his own burden. Every man is going to bear his own burden. But let everyone test his own work, so he will have glory in himself only, and not in comparison with another, for each one shall bear his own burden. And here we have a double mystery of salvation. On the one side, our Lord Jesus Christ says to Adam, I am going to send you a Redeemer. I, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, I am going to send a Redeemer. I'm going to send God the Son in his humanity. He is going to become man. That's one side. But on the other side, he says, one of your children, you, you human beings, you sons of Adam, you must stand in glory and you must fight. You must fight. And so there's going to be a standing in glory and there's going to be a vesting and, there's, and we're going to go into battle in order to fight for Christ. We're going to go into battle vested in the sacred vestments and we're going to fight, and there's going to be glory. So we will go because Christ has redeemed us, but He wants real men to be vested in glory. Do you want to be glorified? Do you want to be praised? Then make yourself the servant of others. Christ does speak about being praised. He who wants to, be, who wants to receive a reward, let Him work. But we have to want the reward. You know, one of the interesting little subtle attacks of Satan in our last 500 years. Very interesting, subtle attack to destroy saints. You know one of the troubles of Catholics today is? One of the terrible troubles of Catholics. They just want to stay out of sin. They just want to stay out of trouble. And if they stay out of sin, and they don't see any sins in their conscience, and their sins are wiped away, and you die that way, well, that means you get to go to heaven. So the purpose of life is simply to stay out of trouble, keep your nose clean, stay out of sin, try to avoid temptations, and be humble. What is this humility? What is it? It's in fact, not humility, it's pusillanimity. Don't confuse the two. Pusillanimity means a small heart. When David went into the battle, he had never been to war before. He is our great example. 
when David went into the battle, he found that there was a war going on between the Philistines and the Jews. It had been going on for 40 days. The only problem with this war is no Jews were fighting. And this is the problem of our war. No Catholics are fighting. We say we are in the great battle. We're on one hill in the camp of Christ. And the devil's on the other hill in the camp of the Satan. And we're going to fight. And we're going to fight. And we're going to fight. Just like an old Kentucky farmer. They're going to fix the fence. Because the cows are going to get out. And they're going to fix the fence. And they're going to fix the fence. You know what? We're going to fix that fence. But they never fix it. They never do it. But they have a lot of conversations about it. We're going to fight the devil. But in order to fight, you're going to fight that victory. And you know what? You can't win if you don't live to the battle. And right down there, there's this really, really big guy. He stands 10 feet tall, and I'm 4 foot 6. Goliath was exactly 10 feet tall. His head, because the measurements are given to us in sacred scripture, his head was the bat that would hit the basketball hoop. He was 10 feet tall. Now, he was big guy. And if you're a four foot six, and you're going to play a guy who's 10 feet, you don't really want to play that game. Now, when you get somebody your own size, and when all the army charges, when everybody's together, because I'm just a simple soldier, what is the problem with those Jews? 40,000 soldiers of the army of God, they looked at Goliath. They were talking about war. But what was their priority? They wanted to stay alive. They wanted to be there for the party when the victory was over. And hence, they did not fight. In the last 400 years, the great victory of Satan is that he has taken men out of the fight. They don't want to fight. They don't want to go to glory. They don't want blessings. They don't want heaven. They just want to stay out of trouble. And if you want to stay out of trouble, you can never be a saint. And if you want to stay out of trouble, you can never stay out of trouble. The devil will get you. So we go to another day. The day of the event of the, of the priesthood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it was the day that Jacob and Esau both wanted blessings. Jacob is the one we follow. Modern man and many modern Catholics follow Esau. Isaac was blind. And Isaac said to Esau, he said, Esau, today I want to bless you. I want to bless you. So get your bow. Get your quiver. And get your arrows. And go thou to go hunting. And he was a great hunter. And with the obedience to his father, he got his bow, he got his quiver, he got his arrows, he went hunting. And go, and use your prowess, and use all of your strength and your wisdom as a great tough guy who has hunted all his life, and go out on a great hunt, and catch me some game, and bring it back, and kill it, and cook it, and bring it to me that I might eat it, and when I have eaten it, I shall bless thee. This is the great mistake of Esau, among several others, with this one aspect. He brought a bow, he brought a quiver, and he brought an arrow to go hunting. What was going to get him his blessing? All those years of experience in practicing hunting. That was going to get him his blessing. That was going to get him his game. And he went, and he went. And then there was Jacob. Jacob was a mama's boy. Jacob also wanted the blessing. What did he do? What did he do? All he did was listen to his mother. Who got the blessing? Who was the father of our Lord Jesus Christ? And who would it be called? His name would be changed. The mama's boy would one day meet an angel. 
He was fair of skin. He didn't have very many muscles. But one day he would meet an angel and he would get angry with the angel after talking to him all day. He said, Dear angel, I've been talking to you all day. Can you please give me your name? He said, I'll give you my name. You're giving me your stinking name. Said, no, I'm not. Well, then you're not leaving. And he fought with an angel of God who was tough. Esau with his bow or Jacob Jacob fought and he wrestled the angel all night. He never gave up on the fight. And he had such a great strength, he was able to fight the angels of God. Where did that come from? Where did it come from? It came from one day when he listened to his mommy. He changed. He became so powerful that he could fight angels all night. He became so powerful that he couldn't give up on a fight. And he could not be defeated. And in the morning, the angel said to him, you're pretty tough. The angel says, you're pretty tough. You're pretty tough. You're a pretty tough guy. You're still asking my name? I'm not going to give it to you. Because you're tough, but you're not that tough. But I'm going to give you a new name. For you shall be called Israel because you have fought with God. And Israel means to fight with God. You know, we were made for battle. You were made to fight. Why do great warriors fight? They fight for glory. They fight for reward. They fight for plunder. And one of the great troubles that the saints tell us a thousand years ago all the time, we don't work for plunder. You know, we are working the problem of the modern man is that he looks for the plunder of the world. There's nothing wrong with looking for plunder. There's nothing wrong with wanting glory. Our problem is we're the wrong kind of glory. And we're going after the wrong kind of plunder. He got a new name. When you get a new name from God, that is something most sacred. A follower of, of the heart of Jacob would also be given a new name. You are no longer Simon. You are now Peter the Rock. Israel was pretty strong. You had some muscles. But you got a rock. Muscles versus rock. Rock wins. Rock wins. So then we finally go into this great battle. And Jacob is strong. He has power. He was not so strong when he was younger. What made him strong? Then he got some deltas. Put on vessels. How did Esau prepare for fight? He had a bow, he had a quiver, he had an arrow. How did Jacob prepare for the fight? Today I have heard your father say that he will bless you. I have heard your father say that he will bless his son Esau, but you are the one that must receive the blessing. You are the one who must fight with God. You are the one whose son must be the Messiah, and not yet, and not Esau. And today is the day. And either you do the right thing today, or you lose the blessing. You lose your soul. We lose the Messiah. We lose everything. God has made all the salvation hinge upon a mama's boy. And a decision that he makes in one morning. But if I go before my father Isaac, he will recognize that I am not Jacob, but I am Esau. He will become angry and he will curse me. I cannot do this thing. Don't worry. I will do all the preparation. I will tell you what to say, says the Holy Mother. You do as I say. Go and kill two kids. And he killed two goats. One was used for the cooking, the other for the vessels. She took the one and she made a vestment. She made clothing of it. And she put it upon his hand so that he might appear hairy. And she put it upon his neck. And she also kept the, kept the best clothes, because he was mommy of Esau, his best regular clothes. 
he had kept beside his breast regular clothes. Whenever he was looking for his nice coat, he could never find it. Because she hid it. When he was looking for his best stuff, she could never find it because she hid it. Because she knew one day it would be Jacob that would wear that. Not him. So he went looking for his good clothes. He couldn't find them because Rebecca had hidden them. But now she pulled them out. And she gave him Esau's clothing. His best. And then she gave him the skin. And then she said, Go to your father. And say to him, I am your son Esau. And this is what we do with the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. The priest dress investments. And he goes, and he stands before God, and he says, I am your son Esau. And he is blind. He also goes before God and says, I am your son Jacob. And thank God, he's blind. When we go and say we are Jacob, we know that we are Esau. And when we go and say that we are Esau, we know that we are Jacob. St. Augustine says, and it's not a lie. Known as mendatium sed mysterium. It is not a lie. Rhymes in Latin, not in English. It is not a lie, but it's a mystery. Jacob does not lie. When I stand before the altar and say, this is my body, it is Esau that speaks. But Jacob becomes present and it's not a lie. When we say, I confess my sins, it is Esau that speaks. But they hear Jacob. God hears Jacob and therefore he forgives, but it's not a lie. He sees Jacob but it's Esau. He sees Esau, but it's Jacob. What makes the difference? It is the vestments. It is the sacred clothing. When a bishop dresses for Mass, he begins by putting on his buskins, his leggings. And he says, O oh, shod my feet, O oh Lord, in the preparation of the gospel of peace, to protect me under the cover of thy wings. We're running into battle. They're going to try to take out the feet. The foot soldier is going to be protected. And he removes his glorious capamania. The big long cape. Says he's a holy bishop. He takes it off. You can't wear that to mass. In the world he's a holy bishop. In the world he rules. In the world he commands. When he goes to mass he cannot wear that. So he removes it. Take off of me, O Lord, the old man. Take him off with his manners. Take him off with his deeds. Put on me the new man who according to God is created into justice and holiness and truth. Now he's ready to vest the battle. We must put off the old man and we need vestments. Why do we need vestments? Why do we need clothing? Clothing will signify our glory. The clothing will also give us a holy deception. Because when we wear the clothing of the priest, when we wear the clothing of glory, God forgets our sins. When we wear the clothing of sins, because when we go to the confessional, he hears rather the prayer of the priest who is praying for the reparation of sins, and he forgets the sins. So then when he hears the words of us as Esau, he hears Jacob. And when he hears the words of Jacob, he hears Esau. And out come blessings. Now why do we go to battle? In order to get blessings. In order to get heaven. In order to get glory. When David saw that there was Goliath, and he saw that there was a battle to be had, and it had been going on for 40 days, he wasn't interested in all the history of the battle. All he knew is that this man had cursed God. And he was going to destroy him. And one day as a reward, he'd be giving the sword of Goliath as his own sword. He would carry the sword of Goliath in the battle later on. He would kill Goliath with his own sword that very day. But he was filled with the fire. The fire of the glory of God. And the fire of the glory that shall be received in heaven. The saints want a reward. It's one of the mysteries of moral theology. Learn in moral theology, for instance, that you don't just simply stay out of sin, and no man can desire just to stay out of sin. No man can desire just to be good, because we're supposed to be good. We can desire these things if we're going to get a reward. 
And God Himself said, Seek first the kingdom of God and His justice, and the other things will be able to receive a hundredfold here below, and eternal happiness. You're going to receive a reward. No love and serve God, and we're going to be happy with Him in heaven. In order to be able to know, love, and serve God for the long haul, in order to be able to do penance for the long haul, in order to be able to do good for the long haul, we have to be desiring heaven. We have to be desiring glory. We have to be desiring victory. And we have to go towards that victory. And there shall be glory, and there shall be a victory if we wear the holy and sacred vestments. And the vestments signify the power of God. He protects us. So that when David, Jacob walked in to be blessed by his father, he was able to be confident. Why? Because his mother had put on him the clothing of Esau. He was able to say, I am thy son Esau, in order to receive the blessing, and he received it. He was able to provide a good food. He carried the food. Christ demands us to carry the food. We must carry the blessed sacrament. We must carry the confessions. We must carry the anointings. We must carry the sacred food. But did we cook it? No. It was prepared by our Holy Mother. We wear the sacred vestments. Now the important. The great priest. What was one of the attentions of that day on Good Friday? They had divided my vestments, my, my, my garments amongst them, and upon my vesture they cast lots. They paid attention to his vestments. And when they came to his, uns, to his robe without seam, it was made by his holy mother that this robe cannot be divided. Therefore they cast lots upon it who should get it. And the great glory of the lucky soldier that got that vestment the vestment of our Lord Jesus Christ. And even on the day of, the, of, the, of His crucifixion, He let them pay attention to His vestments. And so it is important that there be sacred vestments. It is important that there be sacred clothing. It is important that there be a manner of carrying ourselves which represents heaven. And we carry some weapons in the battle. We carry weapons of, 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 of our holy faith into battle. And it represents heaven. So that when a Catholic dresses like a Catholic, he represents Christ, and he covers up his own sins, and he is to be forgiven his sins, and he goes into battle. And what is to be noticed? So that Saint Saint Francis, uh, the sales, for instance, points out, why is it that the woman wears uh, uh, earrings? She wears golden earrings. And God inspired Isaac to buy golden earrings to give to his wife Rebecca, and her wisdom came from those earrings. What do those earrings do, says St. Francis de Sales? They sanctified her ears and they made them gold so that she could no longer hear wicked words, as women are wont to do. She could no longer hear viciousness, but she heard only the voice of God and she heard only good. And so one day, she would happen to be walking by when Isaac said, I am going to bless my son Esau. And she happened to hear it. And because she happened to hear it, she knew what to do. Had she not the golden earrings given by Isaac, had she not lived according to those golden earrings, she would not have heard, and she would have missed the blessing, and Jacob would not receive his vocation. We would not be saved. She began with her holy ears, and hence she wore the golden earrings. And so there must be, God gives a power to clothing to remind us. A young girl comes to be married. Why does she wear a white garment? Because what is the greatest thing that she can bring into the wedding? Perfect chastity and perfect purity. And the garment signifies this holiness of the, of the body, this holiness of her spirit that she brings perfect purity and chastity and cleanness into the wedding. It's interesting also in the, the, the vestments of the bishop. He wears gloves. And it's interesting what it says in the wearing of the gloves. Well, the bishop has to put on gloves. Why is that? Place upon my hands, O Lord, the cleanliness of the new man. Why is that? Because unfortunately when we sin, our hands get dirty. And 
The bishops have so many sins. Their hands got so dirty with so many sins. They have not used all their hands well. They steal and so on. They commit so many sins. So what happens? Place upon my hands, O Lord, the cleanliness of the new man that came down from heaven. That just as Jacob, thy beloved, covering his hands with the skins of goats, offering to his father the most pleasing food and drink, obtained his father's blessing, so also may the saving victim offered by our hands merit the blessing of thy grace through our Lord Jesus Christ, thy Son, whom the likeness of sinful flesh offered himself for us. He puts on the clothes of the vestments, covers his hands, must be clean. The young girl comes to be married, she must be clean. That's what she brings to the wedding. She must bring cleanliness and purity to the wedding. And say, and there, and then if she if there is any sins of her past, they must be wiped out. It is purity that she brings to the wedding. Why is there a great rejoicing at the wedding feast? Because this most pure and most beautiful girl is going to be turned into a holy mother. And she is going to be the future of the human race. So she wears that white dress that signifies this holiness and that matters. And therefore it is a reminder to all those that are going to one day be married, let them bring purity and let them bring a pure soul and a pure body into marriage. That's the way to go into marriage. There is no other way. When they wear those holy garments, the virgins have the most sacred and most beautiful garments in heaven. They are the most beautiful garments, and they will be the most beautiful of all the souls of heaven. So it will be the garments of chastity, the garments of sacred robes worn by the virgins in heaven for all eternity. They shall have sacred vestments. And these vestments are supposed to begin to be put on here, here below. And we have to wear these sacred vestments. And remember that we are made for heaven, and we're supposed to go to battle. When we go to battle, we go with the weapons, the armor of Christ. And then the priest puts on his sacred vestments. And it's interesting for the bishop, unlike the priest, the last vestment that he will wear is the manacle. The manacle that sits on the book now. In fact, in a pontifical high mass, the manacle there sitting on the book where you reach a sermon. So in a pontifical high mass, the, deacon, the subdeacon walks in before the bishop. He has a book of the Gospels in his hands. The bishop is not wearing his manacle. And the maniple is hanging on the book of the Gospels. The subdeacon carries it. The subdeacon who stands for the virtue of chastity. The subdeacon that cleans the altar. Because when we go to battle, we're going to fight for Christ. And so there are two sides of this battle. On the one side, our sins are to be overlooked if we are sorry for them. But if we are not, they shall not be overlooked. Because one day the Jewish war went into battle when one soldier, one soldier only in Moses' army had taken a cup from the idols. He had stolen and he had a cup from the idols. And the entire army of the Jews was massacred. They were defeated and destroyed in battle because one soldier was unclean. He, many soldiers enter the battle, but they don't enter clean. And the uncleanness of these soldiers damages the whole army of Christ, such as is happening today in the church. The, the, the great pedophilia scandals and all the impurity and garbage going on in the church today, they are unclean soldiers, and these unclean soldiers are destroying the church. He must be clean. Now uh, the bishop walks in, the deacon, subdeacon walks in in front of the bishop, and he's got that vestment, the maniple, hanging over. It'll be the last, not the last vestment we priest put on, but it's the last vestment the bishop puts on. He's not allowed to put it on until he's in the Mass. Until he's in the Mass, until he's at the presence of the altar. Only then, after the convener, can he put on that vestment. Because he must make, he is the head of the church, and he must weep for his sins, and he must be truly sorry for his sins, because the bishop is supposed to already be a saint. And he's supposed to weep for his sins, be sorry for his sins, and then he puts on the maniple. We're going to go to battle. We must wear the vestments of Christ to remind us to be like Christ. Why do we wear the holy scapular, the sacred vestment? To remind us to be sorry for our sins. To remind us that the only way, the only garment that is going to protect us against Satan is sorrow for our sins and our holy faith and the love of the Blessed Virgin Mary. 
Because she's the one that makes the vestment. She made the vestment of Christ. She made the vestment of Jacob. She makes the vestment of the priest. And when the God looks down and sees the vestment made by her, maybe that man is not so good. Maybe he's like Jesus the high priest returning in rags, but I remember him. And he is going to be forgiven. But there must be a cleanness of soul. And there must be a wearing of the holy vestments. We are going, we, when, when we dress like the world, we're going to be like the world. When we dress like Christ, it must be for the purpose of glory. We are going to bring our holy faith. We are going to fight against the enemies of God. We are going to receive glory in heaven. There's going to be glory for those that truly fight. We have to desire heaven. We have to desire the victory of Christ. We've got to carry the weapons of Christ into battle. And when the bishop puts on, the priest puts on his chasuble, that I might receive thy grace. And each one of the vestments he puts on, it reminds he is unworthy, that he is a sinner. But he's going to put on these vestments. Like Jacob realized, I am not, or I am not ready. I'm not the right person to be saying these words, but if my mother tells me to say these words, I will say them. This is one reason why we call the priesthood a vocation. Why is it a vocation? Because Jacob on his own was never going to ask for that birthright. Jacob on his own was never going to ask for the blessing. When he went before his father Isaac at the command of, 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 of Rebekah, he said, Art thou my son Esau? He didn't say, Are you Jacob? Art thou my son Esau? And he responded with the words that we all must respond when we were named priest. He said, Atsu, I am. I am here. Atsu means I'm here for a purpose. I am here for glory. I am here for a blessing. I am here for battle. Atsu, I am simply, I'm just standing there, but Atsu, I am here for something. I am ready. Archie Levet used to preach about this in the ordination retreat, this Atsu. Jacob stood and he was ready. Why was he ready? We repeat the words of Jacob when we ordained priests. We stand there as subdeacons, stand there as deacons, stand there as we ordained priests. And the bishop says, Are you are you ready to be subdeacons? Are you ready to give up all of the world and go to Christ? Are you ready to be a deacon? Are you ready to be a priest? Are you ready to go to battle? I'll soon. We repeat the words of Jacob. I am here and I am ready. And Jacob said, Adsum. He was asked, Art thou my son Esau? And hence you must understand that when a young man is called to the holy priesthood, it's not because he feels he has a personal vocation. Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. It's not because he thinks he has the strength to go to battle. It's because God calls. Some don't want to hear the call. Like a rich young man who was called by God himself and he said, go sell all you have. Give to the poor and come follow me. He was asked to follow. Did he follow? No, he did not. How many times does St. Bernard? How many times does St. Benedict? How many times St. Gregory? In fact, every saint. How many times do they say, you, come and follow Christ? You, leave this modern and disgusting world and come and follow Christ? Did they all say yes? Absolutely not. They did not. Many do not. And what is the reason? For most of them, it's because I can have more happiness in the world. I can have more peace in the world. I can survive better in the world. If I go to the priesthood, if I go to the religious life, I can't have more happiness. I can't have more peace. And it's a higher calling. Did David consider the higher calling? No. He saw that there was a war to be fought. There's a Goliath to be slain. He has cursed God, and no one else is doing it. I'm charging. Jacob was afraid. He was still afraid that very day, because after he got the blessing, he had to run away. Only later did he have the strength to be called Israel. Only later did fear go out for him. And only later was he ready to fight an angel. He wasn't ready on this day. He was just ordained. So likewise, so many come into battle, and hence the bishop walks into the church without the maniple on. Because there are many bishops. There are many priests. We are instructed, for instance, in preaching the sermon, don't wear the maniple. Sometimes we forget, don't take it off. Hmm? Don't wear it. Because here I tell you holy words. Here I tell you what you're supposed to do. 
Am I doing it? Not now. Not now. That is determined when I'm in the battlefield. That is determined when I've walked away from the pulpit. In the pulpit, I must tell you the things of God. I'm going to tell you, tell you what is right and what is wrong. But does it mean I'm doing it? Not at all. And it's no maniple. Because a maniple is a maniple of weeping and sorrow. The maniple of lamentations. There must be lamentations in the priest. There must be weeping and sorrow. And maniple means a bundle. And we're reminded of that bundle. For there are two great bundles. In the end of the world, the angels are going to gather two bundles. The bundles of the damned, they're going to be cast into the fire. And the bundles of wheat, they're going to be gathered in the barn. And the maniple also means bundles. We're going to be carrying bundles. We must carry a bundle of souls. We have to pack souls upon our back. We have to carry them on our back into the kingdom of heaven. They are not carried at the pulpit. Although this is part of the work that we have to do. They are carried at night. They are carried in the battlefield. They are carried at the altar. Hence, no maniple during the service. It's on the book of the Gospels. The bishop walks in. He's not allowed to wear it. The priest wears it when he walks in for Mass. But he who has the fullness of the priesthood, he doesn't wear it when he walks in for Mass, for the pontifical Mass. He does not have on his maniple until the very last thing. Because God gives power to the bishop on the condition that the bishop follows the will of God. And the bishop is clean. And the bishop is strong in faith. And he recognizes the power of his episcopacy and the power of the priesthood. The power of the priesthood is in the sacred vestments given by God. In the sacred vestments made by Our Lady. The power of the priesthood is in Christ and not in us. But it has been given to us and someone must wear the vestments. They've taken the vestments away. They've taken the clothing away. And though we all must wear the clothing of Christ, we must wear modest clothing. We must wear the correct clothing. The clothing of men, the clothing of ladies, they should all wear their dresses. The clothing of priests should always wear his cassock. The clothing of each, each, each position must be worn. And they are to remind us that though I, as a weak human being, am not worthy of these things, I am still a representative of God, and I must live up to the holiness of the vestments. So that Jacob said, I am your son Esau, and he did not lie. Another would say the same word and be telling a lie. And Jacob told the word, and it was not a lie. And so which of us speaks the same words? We all say the words of the Mass. Who is telling the truth and who is lying? The words sound the same. Who is speaking with Jacob and who is speaking with Esau? Who is speaking truth and who is not? God alone knows. And there he requires of us a whole virtue of faith. It requires a virtue of faith. So this is where the, 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 the sacred vestments... When he puts on the amice, put on the helmet. Protect me from the deceits of the devil. Go into battle. In any case, we'll skip the rest. And uh, there's a consideration that we have to go into battle wearing the, wearing the vestments of Christ. And we have to be recognize that our strength and glory is to wear these holy vestments. It matters what we wear. And we wear these things in order to follow Christ. The women wear veils when they go into the church. They wear the, they wear the dress. The men dress as men. Now, they're, now we're changing the dress of men with these tight little pants and girly pants things. We're trying to switch now. And they're wearing the earrings and they're being effeminate. And they're also trying to be able to go after their own little glory. No, we must follow the way of Christ. And we must follow Him into the great battle. And remember that we're made to follow Him. And Jacob, Jacob did become strong. And we have to remember the only way to do that is by the love of our Holy Mother. It's the only way. Jacob was, was the love of the Blessed Virgin. The Blessed Virgin made the vestment of Christ. The Blessed Virgin made the vestments of Jacob. She makes the vestments of the priests. And we go with confidence into the battlefield, with confidence on the altar of God, and we speak words that we know are true. It is most true. When the weak priest says, Hope est anum carpus meum. It sounds like a lie. Because it's not that Jacob speaking as if he's Esau. It's not Esau speaking as if he's Jacob. No, Christ gives the power and it's not a lie. 
It is truly Christ that speaks. And when we beg forgiveness for our sins, we don't only get forgiveness for our sins, but the sins of those of our sheep. There must be a crying. The priest weeps for the sins of the people between the porch and the altar, it says in the sacred scripture, and there are not enough priests weeping. There are not enough priests carrying their manipulums. You must carry them. For in the, in the carrying them out, you will carry your, 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 be prepared for grace. May I merit to bear the manifold of lamentation, that with joyfulness I may receive the portion of the just. Going, they go weeping. Returning, they return with rejoicing. In any case, leave it at that the present. Remember, it made us follow Christ and wear the sacred vestments to remind us of Him and, uh, and, and live according to the Holy Gospel. Close that and God bless you all. Father, and